G'day guys, my name's Ben and welcome to the channel. And today we are in part two of this small video series where I'm reviewing MacBook Pro laptops that I currently own. And today is the 2016 MacBook Pro, which I'm going into a little bit more detail of. Now this video is actually a small chunk of a larger video that I already have on my YouTube channel where I compare my 2015, 2016 and the 2020 MacBook Pro. But if you do want to jump ahead and check that out, I'll leave a link up here because that is the whole video. Otherwise, if you get through this video, you can jump ahead to part three or go back and look at part one where I compare the 2015 and 2020 laptops. But otherwise, here is the 2016 MacBook Pro and I hope you enjoy the video. All right, the 2016 MacBook Pro. What an adventure we have been through over the last four years. Before I even get into the computer, it has disappeared out of my life on multiple occasions for repairs, for recalls, for battery replacements, for keyboard replacements. It has been arguably a nightmare. In fact, while I've been waiting for my 2020 MacBook Pro to arrive, this computer was hanging on by a thread. Overall, this computer was problematic and you cannot compare it to the reliability of the 2015. Now the 2016 MacBook Pro, that's been my work computer for four years now, and we've been through a lot together. The general programs and stuff that I use for work is a mix of like your general kind of corporate admin software, emails, Word, PowerPoint, things like that. But with my creative work that I do, there is extensive Photoshop and Premiere work and a little bit of 3D programming and things like that too. So it was pretty exciting to get the 2016 MacBook Pro when it first arrived. Whole new model, new ports, new keyboard, new this, new that. And really for me, it did not take long until kind of the honeymoon period wore off and I really started to get annoyed by some of its features. Now in 2016, USB-C was obviously a very unknown port for most people. And when I actually got this computer at work, like the, the tech teams had trouble finding screens and adapters and ports and cables that would actually work with this computer. And eventually it took a while, but we did have a winning formula. Now with the 2016 MacBook Pro, I certainly did not like the keyboard that came with it. And after a couple of days of use, particularly back then before COVID, when we were working in an office, it was within days that my colleagues were starting to complain to me about how loud the keyboard was. It really is like you're tapping on a thin piece of plastic and it is loud and tacky. According to my colleagues, the volume of my keyboard is kind of at a level where it's like dragging your fingernails down a blackboard. It's just at that frequency that can kind of overpower something else. Now this MacBook 2 introduced the touch bar and I personally am not a fan of the touch bar and I have not really found too many uses for it. As a touch typist, I guess, I really prefer knowing where those keys are without needing to kind of hold certain buttons to bring up a screen that represents what those original buttons should be. So being able to jump through all these different apps and figure out the shortcuts and things like that didn't really appeal to me. What I have found helpful though is really reverting the touch bar to the same features that my 2015 personal computer had. And without a doubt, my favorite shortcut is just simply the quick switching between apps and also the show desktop button. And that's really all I use the touch bar for on this computer. It just seems like most developers don't really care about the touch bar either. And there's really not much support outside of the core Apple suite. The thing that kind of annoyed me a little bit compared to when I'm using my 2015 is using the right click function on the big trackpad often got a little bit annoying because you really did have to kind of move across to the right side to use that click properly. Also, as you'll see a little bit later in the video, the 2016 MacBook really performs at almost exactly the same level as the 2015. Now this computer did have a bump up in specs, but it just seems like, especially after this amount of time, that it's really not enough to justify a performance gain. And especially doing travel and things like that with the 2016, you really do appreciate how much more lightweight and portable that computer is. But while I say that, this computer and the 2020 still mean you need to bring all those dongles and adapters with you. However, in 2020, most devices have a USB-C port now and cabling, and really it does simplify the whole process. 
So some common problems that I had with the 2016 was just random and frequent crashes. I would have frequent Bluetooth disconnection issues in particular with the 2016 with my other computers not having the same level of Bluetooth connection trouble. I'd also had problems with the USB-C ports as well. In fact, I actually had to get them replaced under warranty. It was quite common for me to lose connection to my desktop screens with no explainable reason. Literally having to unplug, replug, on again, off again, repeatedly on this, this specific laptop before it would start working again. And especially in apps like Photoshop and PowerPoint too, like you would just randomly have crashes that would shut the whole computer down repeatedly, almost by doing the same process every single time. Just on the 2016 MacBook Pro though, and yes, we have reformatted the computer to see if that would fix it, and didn't. That keyboard, man, that keyboard, it was so bad, like, it got replaced multiple times in the four years that I've owned it, but even then, like, on the day I got my computer back after being repaired, I had like a tacky key that didn't work properly. And after dealing with the whole replacement process, you can't put your computer back in and go through the whole process again. So I just lived with this tacky key and eventually it kind of gave up and started working normally. What I will say though, is towards the end of its life, I guess more like around 2019, 2020, I really did start to appreciate that USB-C port. Almost everything I had was powered by USB-C at this point. If I traveled, I just had to chart like one USB-C cord that would do almost every device that I had. And that was amazing. So yeah, if you're looking in the secondhand market and you're kind of evaluating whether you should go 2015 or 2016, go the 2015. Now, I think there's a few benefits to the 2016 MacBook Pro now in 2020. Obviously you get those USB-C ports and, and things like that, but the keyboard, and the connection problems and all of that stuff, I really do find it hard to recommend. And for me, I am so happy that I'm finally able to move on. So I'm certainly thankful to cross the finish line with the 2016 MacBook Pro. And now I'm gonna jump in and talk to you about the 2020 MacBook Pro in part three of this video series. So there will be a link at the end of this video above and in the description below if you wanna jump ahead and check that one out. Also, there is part one where I talk about the 2015 MacBook Pro. And if you just wanna jump ahead and see all this content in one, there is a video that has all three of these videos in one, which I will leave in the description as well for you. But that's enough for today. So we'll see you around and have a good one. Cheers. Thank you.